Jared, obviously it was a, a frustrating result last time out. I'm just kind of curious, I guess, you know, what lessons you take and out of that one? Uh, well, you know, I was doing really well on the feet. And I thought I looked better on the feet than I have in a while. Um, and the mistakes that I made against Grant were things that I know. It's like almost MMA 101. You got taken down, like, don't give up your back. And I preached that all the time. And I was like, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up. And then he had his hooks in. And, you know, he wasn't just putting his hooks in. He was putting – he was going straight to the body triangle. So, like, there wasn't any, like, fighting the hooks. And um, I kept making the same mistake. But I've worked on that a lot, um, just not getting frustrated. You know, you can get taken down and then go to your back and then get up from there instead of just rushing and getting stuck in a worse position. So I learned a lot. So I was curious, right, submission loss, and the next name comes up, oh, it's Leo Santos, by the way. I mean, it's, it's, kinda, it's almost comical in a way, right? I mean, what did you think when this was the name that was given to you? Uh, I mean, fight's a fight, right? But... You know, and I fought Joe Selecki before Grant Dawson, who did the same thing to me in the first round. I won the fight. Um, but, you know, it was my first submission loss ever in my professional and amateur career. Um, but you fight in this game long enough, you know, things happen. But I think it's a great fight for me. I think I was supposed to fight him when I, was, when I fought Oliveira. Uh, and he pulled out, and then they put me in against Charles. And we know how that went. But um, great fight, great win for me. And, um, you know, if it was King Kong or Leo, what's the difference? Fight's a fight. Obviously, you're not going to tip your game plan, but I'm just curious. I mean, is this the kind of fight where you're like, you know, I know the right thing to do in these situations, but the, the ideal thing to do would be like not grapple at all in this fight? No, I don't think that that is – I have good grappling as well. I mean, and – you know, we're, it's an MMA fight, so um, no, I'm not trying to stay away from the grappling. I think there's a misconception, like, when I'm on top, I hurt people. I do really well there, and I know how to get up. I made a mistake in the last one, uh, but, you know, I think that it's a great fight. In the, You know, he's getting older. I'm not banking on him being old, and that's why I'm going to win. Oh, he's going to slow down. I'm expecting him to be in the best shape of his life. Uh, but I think, I think I'm going to overwhelm him and get the victory. Big win here. Uh, what's the plan moving forward? I mean, is it to just book again as quickly as possible or take some time off? What's the plan? Um, MSG. I was born in Manhattan, literally 30 blocks from Madison Square Garden. Um, I used to train at Henzo Gracie's, which is four blocks away from Madison Square Garden. I used to shoot dope in the bathroom down the block from Madison Square Garden. My grandfather fought at Madison Square Garden. Uh, I think it's my destiny to fight there, you know. Um, I'm going to win this fight, and then, and then I'll say what I have to say in the cage after I win. And when you say that, do you think you probably leave the shooting dope part out of it, or is it, is it good no, to leave no. that in there? I need to let everyone know that. You know, you can shoot dope and still get to the highest level of athletics. Last thing for me, obviously you want to make a big statement so you can get that time on the mic. How do you see this fight going? I mean, is this something where you can go in and, you know, get it done quick or you're going to have to survive some, you know, bad grappling spots? I think that he's more dangerous on the feet than he will be early on with the grappling. And he doesn't tend to, like, shoot doubles and singles. He's more of a clinch guy. He'll throw you, you know, judo throws and stuff. So I think he's going to try to hurt me on the feet. Uh, I'm expecting to have to dodge and weave and maybe take some shots and answer back. Uh, but I'm going to get on the inside, and, and I think uh, he's going to slow down, and I think it's going to be a bad night for him. Generator, uh, what exactly happened in this? Uh, you, you subdued a baseball bat-wielding maniac. Like, what happened there? Uh, video is old. I just reposted it because, you know, that's what the public wants to see. They don't really care about inspirational stuff. They just want to see blood and violence and sex and stuff so every now and then I'll throw something a little ridiculous up but uh I was in Chicago on vacation with my parents my cousin and her husband and I there was an ATM machine a pull through ATM machine and there's a guy in his car and on his bumper sticker it said I love crack whores so I was like haha you know I get my phone out I start filming and I, I'm like noticing that he's like climbing through to the passenger side to get out of the car because he can't get out because the ATM's in the way of his door. 
And I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Excuse my language. Uh, and he's going in the trunk. And we're in Chicago. And I'm like, huh. Is he going to pull out an AK-47 or something? But he pulls out a bat. And now I'm like, I'm going to kill this guy. I got really upset very fast because he starts walking towards me fast. I'm with my parents. They're in their 60s. And I grab him. And I'm like, are you, what are you? And he's like, oh, what are you, you're filming my license plate. I'm like, dude, you, have a, you know what's on your bumper sticker, unless this is in your car and you never looked at it. So you, you, you haven't gotten any attention with this bumper sticker before? Um, and my cousin's husband grabbed him. We took him down. I stepped on his neck and ripped the bat out of his hands, and, and that was that. How long ago was this? 2019. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, hey, it worked, though, right? Look, we're talking about it. What happened to the guy after? You just He was him. like, can I have my bat back? And I was like, are you fucking joking me? No. And uh, he just went on his way. I don't know how I didn't pound his face in. I, I feel like it's because my parents were there, but I've seen my parents fight in the street before. So it's not like it would be anything new for us, but I just, I don't know, somehow I was able to restrain myself and, you know, blood, and then you got to call the cops, and it's like, uh, so I just let it go. Where do you see yourself beating Leonardo Santos? Uh, on the inside. In his face, in his chest, um, going to the body, going to the head, and level changes, getting him to faint a lot and, you know, draw his strikes out, get him lean, extending too much. And um, it's going it, to, unfortunately for me, not unfortunately, but I'm not the biggest 55er ever. I'm actually probably on the smaller end. So everyone's taller and longer. I always got to make it dirty and get on the inside. I'm not going to be one of those guys that are, standing on the outside, unless I get lucky and land a big shot. But he's way longer than me and taller, so, you know, I got to make it like a Mike Tyson fight, get in there, weave my head, and go, you know, and make it fast and hard and dirty. He also got subbed in his last fight, and so considering your grappling background as well, is that something that you're counting out is, is your possibility of submitting him? No, no, I think if I punch you in the face enough on the ground, you'll give up your neck eventually. Uh, I'm not the type of guy that's going to look for submissions constantly because – to me, it just doesn't make sense in MMA. If I can, if I can uh, accrue strikes, then it's better for me. Can I drink this water? Sorry, I was eating. I got like shit in my teeth. What's up? Who's next? <laughs> my guy. What's up? That's it. Come on. So you're a fighter that talks openly about your addiction. For example, local legend Court McGee, he's talked about how MMA has uh, impacted his sobriety. How has MMA helped you become more sober? MMA hasn't helped me at all. Actually, it's made my life worse. I'm not even joking. Uh, MMA doesn't give me any fulfillment whatsoever. It, I, I'm able to use my platform to help people through MMA. Um, but, like, whether I win or lose, three days later, I'm miserable again. Now i got to do it again. It's like drugs. Uh, i got to look for another fix. All right, what's next? What's next? You, you see it all the time. These guys become multiple world-time champions, champions, and they're fighting into their 40s looking for that, that next thing. Oh, they're looking for something. They're trying to fill a void. The only thing that fills my void is God, my family, my wife, my relationships, and helping other people. That's the only thing that gives me fulfillment is helping other people. So I need UFC and this platform to help others. You know, if Logan Paul or whatever their, his name, Jake or whatever his name is, and Floyd and Conor McGregor, no offense, you know, I'm not like trying to put them down, but if they were preaching about mental health and addiction, how many people would listen? You know, I don't have a platform like they do. The goal is to get there. You know, and they're driving around in Lamborghini boats and flashing chains and all my shiny shit doesn't do anything for me. My car, I'm wearing a Rolex right now. I'm wearing this just for this. Like, I like it, but it's like a burden on my life. I'm still paying it off. I've owned it for a year. It's a burden on my life. So fighting, I love martial arts. It's my passion. I love competing. But now it's, it's not for me. None of this is for me. It's for the people that I, I'm trying to help. You know? With that being said, do you have any advice for any fighters struggling with addiction? Yeah, don't use MMA as your, as your reason, because I did that, and I always ended up 
back on the street. Um, nothing tangible is enough to keep you from going back to drugs or filling that void or depression. You need to find your purpose, your higher power, and, and you need to uh, get spiritually fit. That's like the only way. If it's for everyone in life in general. You don't have to be a, you don't have to be a junkie. You, you know, you can still be miserable. My, one of my best friends, MMA fighter, beautiful life, took his life. Uh, I had no idea. You know, I see people dying every day. I work in the field of addiction. I see kids, 17, 16, dying every day. Their parents had no idea. Died of a fentanyl overdose. So we're all trying to fill the void, right? So you gotta, you got to figure it out.